John chapter 2. And tonight we get to uh, we get to see the first of seven signs in the Gospel of John. It's interesting that he uses that word to describe these that we would normally call miracles. There are seven miracles that, that Jesus performs in the book of John. Actually, there's a, there, there, I think we could argue there's eight miracles, but there are seven that John refers to as signs. And I think the, the significance of that um, is based on the purpose of his writing. Remember the reason that he writes the gospel, the reason that he wrote the gospel of John. He tells us that at the end of the gospel, and we've looked at it a number of times. Now, Jesus did many other signs. You see, there's our word. He uses that word to describe th these miracles that demonstrate who he is. That, that's, what he, that's why he chooses the word sign instead of miracle. A miracle might be something that one would do, and we would all say, wow, that's cool. A sign is something that Jesus does that, that points us to the truth. It helps us understand who he is. So the, there are two Greek words. One word means miracle and one word means sign, and he chose this word sign. So he ends his book by saying, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus Christ, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And there in those two verses we see two of our key words. Remember we're forming a list of key words in the Gospel of John. And these are two of those words that we already found in chapter 1. He, we see them again at the end of the gospel. John says, I told you about the things Jesus did so that you would believe he is the Christ, that he is the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life. It's the whole purpose of the gospel. And tonight we finally get to see the first of those signs. We'll pick it up at um, chapter 2, verse 1. And I'll just give you, uh, give you a little bit of a warning. It's going to take me a little while to get through the first two verses. All right? <laughs> On the third day, stop. <laughs> <laughs> what is the third day? Well, remember in chapter 1, there is what we call the prologue, the first 18 verses uh, we call that the prologue, and, and it is there that John introduces us to God the Son, introduces us to the Logos. The Word was with God, the Word was God, uh, he was the light, but the darkness didn't receive him, all that stuff, right? That's the prologue to the book. The, in, in the remaining part of chapter 1, we saw four days. John the Baptist shows up, right? The Pharisees come to him. I shouldn't have said Pharisees. The, the Jewish leaders come to him. Who are you? Well, I'm not Messiah, if that's what you're looking for. He's coming later. Then uh, disciples. Uh, he, he points to his disciples. and Oh, no, the crowd. The crowd. He talks to the crowd about Jesus. Then he points his disciples toward Jesus. And then on day four... Jesus starts getting those disciples uh, to follow him. And so we see four days in chapter 1. So when chapter 2 opens with, on the third day, that is not talking about the third day of the week or the third day of the month. It means on the third day after the last thing we talked about. Right? So if you want to, you could go back and see what was that last day. And it was the day that Jesus called Philip and Nathaniel. That began in verse 43. So three days after Jesus calls these disciples, uh, 
and begins a journey. Chapter 1 ended with him saying that he wanted to go to, uh, to Galilee. And we looked at the map a little bit last time. This is all taking place. Chapter 1, verses 19 through the end, all take place right here. Bethany beyond the Jordan. And he, he says that he wants to make this journey up here to Galilee. And so he's headed in that direction. Somewhere along the way, I think it happened immediately, but somewhere along the way, he picks up Philip and Nathaniel on the journey. So it's on the third day since he decided to leave, and on this third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. So, he has journeyed from here to there over this three-day journey. On the third day, there's a wedding here in Cana. Uh, Cana is the hometown of Nathaniel, and it is, it's about nine miles north of Nazareth, where Jesus actually grew up. Uh, <clears throat> these two little towns are, I think, um, I think unique. Uh, well, not unique. I would say they are familiar to us because they are very small towns. Nazareth is probably 500-ish, and Cana is even smaller than that. The reason I point that out is when you've got two small towns... In, a, in nine miles distance, they probably all know each other and most of them are probably related, <laughs> right? There's a lot of relatives lives in this little town. And a lot of the people in this little town are related to folks who live just right up the highway up there in Abbott. <laughs> it's the same thing. So when we say Jesus grew up in Nazareth, what is there, what's his family doing at a wedding in Cana? Well, have you ever known Abbott people to come to a wedding in West? <laughs> West people ever go to a wedding in Abbott? This is, this is what small towns do. This is who we are, right? So this is what's happening. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited. Stop. Mary was there. Jesus was invited. I love that distinction. Mary was there. Apparently, she had some kind of role in helping the wedding. She may have been a friend might have been a relative we just we don't know who the wedding was for but apparently she had some kind of role she had a connection with the families we know that because she had some inside information here in a little bit that not everybody knew so she was there i take that to mean she was helping probably from the beginning uh, when my daughter got married uh, not long ago we had, we had a handful of friends who worked with us all night Friday and all day Saturday to just keep things going. This is the role of Mary. Mary was there, but Jesus was invited. And let me just say to you, if you, if you ever plan a wedding, you order all those expensive invitations, you order the flowers, you get your DJ, you pay the pre you hire the preacher, you, you, <laughs> you get it all lined up. Don't forget when you're inviting hundreds of people to your big shindig, don't forget the one invitation that matters the most. Mary was there. Jesus was invited. I think we'd have a whole lot more successful marriages today if Jesus was invited to the weddings. Amen. But we leave him out so often. Now, at first, on the surface, that might sound kind of trite. As I was thinking about it, I, I thought back 
to when I got married uh, 36 years ago. And we had a meeting with the preacher before the wedding. And he told us, be sure you invite Jesus. And then in the wedding, he said, our special guest today is Jesus. It bothered me that he called Jesus a guest because we got married in his house, and here we say in, G in, in God's house. So he, Jesus is not a guest in his daddy's house. You know? but, but the idea was, based on this, we, we don't leave him out. And isn't it cool that the first sign, the first miracle that Jesus performs is done at a wedding. He could have done it at a, at a he could have done it in the marketplace. He could have done it at the temple. We might expect him to do it at the local synagogue. He could have done it in the street. Maybe he should have, you know, he, he could have gone to the little league field down the other side. Of, but it was at a wedding. And I, I think that at least lets us know that God honors what happens in weddings. There are some places that you and I don't go because that's not what we honor. Jesus wouldn't have been here if God didn't honor the weddings. David, what's on your mind? When he was invited, he hadn't started his ministry though, right? Probably. Uh, that his invitation is... would have probably gone out a month or so before or whatever. Yes. So they didn't know they were inviting Christ Correct. to their wedding. Absolutely. Yes. And he took that opportunity to do his first sign. That's right. This is the beginning of his ministry. Yes. This is the first event in his ministry. John, John the Baptizer has just pointed him out to the crowd and said, Hey, everybody, that's him. And now he's got six disciples who are following him around. And this is the first thing that he does. To, this is the initiation into his ministry. Good question. So on the third day, there's a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, and we got to stop. <laughs> weddings, weddings in Jesus' time were not what they are today. There's a process involved in Jewish weddings in Jesus' day. There was first what we call betrothal. Remember when Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph were betrothed, but not really married. Okay? That is the first step. It, you and I think of it like engagement. The difference is today we can get engaged and we can break off the engagement, no harm, no foul, we go on. In their culture, the, this betrothal, this engagement was a, a contractual agreement. They're, they're, they had entered into a covenant. So you don't break a, a, a betrothal, a, an engagement, if you will. But once you're betrothed, engaged, that lasts for like a year or so. During that time, the groom is earning money, building a home, building a house, getting everything settled, everything ready. He is demonstrating to the community and to the bride's family that he can take care of her. That's the entire year he is demonstrating that he can take care of her and he's building the whole thing and getting it ready. Then when it's time for the actual wedding, the wedding takes days, up to a week. I've been to a few weddings that felt like it took days. <laughs> but their weddings took about a week for the full celebration. The actual final ceremony, you know, jump over the broom or step on the glass or whatever it is, the, the final ceremony was usually on Wednesday, 
for virgins. Um, the, uh, the widows had theirs usually set on Thursday, which is just kind of interesting. It's all based on the creation story. Uh, they, try to, they try to aim the, the wedding day for the day in creation where there were two blessings. If you go back to, to, John, to Genesis 1, God says, oh, this is good. There's a blessing on day one. Oh, this is good on day, but on day three, he says it twice. So they want to be doubly blessed, so they plan their weddings, and that falls on, on Wednesday. So there's, there's a lot that goes on, a lot that goes into this thing. There's major planning, and the groom's family pays for everything. May I stress that again? <laughs> this is how it should be. Those of you who don't know me personally, I have an only child, and she is my daughter. And the only wedding we had was for the daughter, and I'm stressing the groom should pay for everything. <laughs> so when we read in verse 3, the wine ran out, what we're talking about is we're halfway through the week, and the wine is running out. This is a problem. This is not just a, 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 a problem with hospitality. Those of you who've been around uh, for more than a year, I, I hope you got to come to our Christmas at the Crowders, our little open house we have in our home every year. And my wife goes absolutely nuts those two weeks leading up to that. And she cooks for 12 churches. You know, and there's always this massive amount of food that's always left over. And she tells me, her, by the way, I, and this is not being silly, but seriously, her spiritual gift is hospitality. And so she, te she has taught me that you want to end the event with food left over instead of risking running out of food before the event concludes. And she's pretty good at having that, having that leftover. <laughs> but, so here's the problem. We're only about halfway through the week and the wine is already running out. This is such a major problem in their culture that there, he could actually be fined for this. Uh, the, the community could charge him, uh, kind of like a lawsuit. We trusted this young woman to you, and now you have proven that you can't even provide enough wine for one week. Also remember that the wedding was the social event. I mean, it was, it was bigger than Friday night football in Texas. The wedding was the the party that they got to have. This was a massive thing. And now he's going to ruin it? So this is a major problem, not just a kind of inconvenience. This is a problem. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. This is why we believe that Mary was connected to the families. She was there, I don't know, like a, a, a friend of the mother of the bride, a wedding planner, a, a hostess. I, I, I have always pictured that she was friends with the, the, the groom's mom, you know, something like that. But she knew what was going on, and, and we find out in a minute that not everybody knew this was inside information. This was a problem. So she goes to Jesus, and she says they have no wine. Now, understand as well, I do not believe, although there are some commentators who disagree with me and they're wrong, um, <laughs> I do not believe that Mary is telling Jesus to perform a miracle. I think she is going to the problem solver in her family. Remember, Joseph has most likely, although we cannot verify it in Scripture, most likely Joseph has died by now. 
We know that Joseph died before Jesus was crucified because when he's crucified, he says, John, take care of mom. Mom, you go with John because there was no Joseph anymore. We, we believe that, that Joseph died somewhere between Jesus age 12 and age 30. So um, with Joseph out of the picture, Mary turns to her firstborn, Jesus, to solve the problems at the house. The plumbing's not, not working. Jesus, we got a problem. The, 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 the garbage disposal's backed up again. Jesus, we got a problem. I can't, you, I can't make this remote talk to this TV. You know, <laughs> Jesus, we got... I think this is what she does. She goes to Jesus as the problem solver for the family. Jesus, they don't have any wine. What are we going to do? Verse 4, Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now, when I read that, that sounds so harsh. I know if I had ever answered my mom by calling her woman, I would not be standing before you tonight. In their culture, remember we've got to always understand scripture set in its culture. In their culture, this word is not disrespectful. It's more like, it's more like the southern word man. Man is not disrespectful. It's actually respectful. I don't know who in our current culture decided that was an insult, but that's just stupid. <laughs> yes, sir. No, ma'am. That's respect. And so he, it sounds odd to our ears, but by the way, this is the same word he used when he's dying on the cross, and he says, woman, behold your son. Look, John's going to take care of you. It's a, it's a word of respect, but it is not a word of intimacy. In other words, he does not call her mama. Something has changed. She comes to him as her son. And he responds, yes, ma'am, but not mom, not mama. He is saying to her, as of this day, as, as David helped us point out, this is the beginning of his ministry. Something's new happening here. He points out to her, our relationship changes today. Now my primary task is not to fix your problems and to be your son. Now, my primary task is to do the work of my father. You remember when he was 12? He wandered into the temple and he's teaching the teachers. Mary and Joseph find out that he's not around. They go looking for him. They find him in the temple and he said what? Didn't you know that I would be about my father's business? This is the day. I think, I think he was not only speaking on that day, but, but this now is kind of fulfills that. He says, woman, I can't from this day forward, I can't worry about making sure that, that I do what you tell me. I'm here now to do what my father tells me I'm about his business. My hour has not yet come. We're going to track that through our gospel as we go through the study together. And we're going to see that he says that. I don't have an exact number. You could count them on your hand. I, I would say probably four times through the gospel, maybe five times. He says, my hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. Until... <laughs> until that night that he's taken and they're headed to the cross and he says, now my hour has come. So he says to her, 
this doesn't have anything to do with me because this is this is family stuff and I'm here for another purpose I'm headed to the cross my hour hasn't come yet but that's the journey that I'm on now and so she says then his mother said to the servants do whatever he tells you she does not speak to him and convince him to do anything she speaks to the servants I, I don't know I, I think that she is catching on now that he has turned a corner and he's beginning his ministry remember she knew before he was born who he was going to be she knew when he was born, it said that she pondered these things and kept them in her heart. Eight days after his birth, they took him to the temple to be circumcised. And when they walked in there, there was the, there was the prophet, who was his Simeon. And he said, I've seen Messiah, so now I can die. She knew who he was. And I think this signaled to her that something is changing. I, I, I'm, I'm beginning now. So when she goes to the servants, she is not doing an in run around him to manipulate him into having to do something. She's going around to the servants and said, if he tells you to do something, you better do it. By the way, that's pretty good advice for us too. <laughs> If he tells you to do something, you better do it. So they're, uh, they're at the wedding. The wedding's going to last a whole week. They're halfway through the week and already running out. And so uh, Jesus said, Mary says, uh, hey, we got a problem. He says, woman, what does that have to do with me? Uh, it, literally, that phrase, what does that have to, what does this have to do? Literally, it is more like, um, what, what is that to you and to me? Um, and the reason I, I, I say it, I, I wanted you to hear it, more literal translation, is there's more of a relationship involved. What is that to you and to me? He, he's talking about the relationship they share more than we hear. What does that have to do with me? He, he's saying, what does that have to do with us? More like it. My relationship with you has changed. So his mother said to the servants, do what he says. Now, there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification. <clears throat> All right? Um, it's important that we understand these jars, John makes it clear. Remember, John is writing to a primarily Greek audience, so they don't know all of the Jewish um, customs. Thank you, David. So John is so good at explaining things to a Greek audience. Uh, he reminds them that these stone water jars are not for drinking. They are for purification. Why that's significant is twofold. One, uh, the Jewish custom was you would wash your hands and half, you know, halfway up your arm before you ate and after you ate. So there was this whole little, little procedure where you pour the water and you wash like this, then you pour the water, you wash like this, and then back like this, and I don't really remember all the steps, but there was a very specific order in which one washed. You and I wash our hands so we don't, the germs and junk and stuff that's on our hands don't make it into our mouths. That is not what they were thinking at all. They were merely obeying the purification rites. The Old Testament, the law, and the, and, and the, the uh, customs of the day taught them that you want to, you, you want to symbolically, ritually be purified before you receive the gift that God has given you in that food, okay? So in order to do that, you had to have a whole lot of water. So they got these six 
stone jars, not clay, because clay was thought, it was thought at that time that clay could contain impurities. Those impurities then could get in the water and then you can't be pure if you're using impure water, so they had to be hewn out of stone. And so they would, they would put these out there. They did not drink from these pitchers, these containers, primarily because water was not good for you. In fact, their water was not healthy to drink. And uh, because it was not healthy to drink, the practice was you would get wine Wine is usually grapes, but not always. They, they used other fruit as well. Let it ferment. So you got a cup of apple juice out there, next to, you know, and next week it's going to be fermented. So there you go. And so what they would do, they, they didn't, if, if you drink the water, you get sick. If you only drink the wine to, to quench your thirst, you get drunk. Well, the Bible says you, you don't get drunk. So what do you do? They would take the wine and put it in the water, at least a three to one ratio, three waters for one wine. And by doing that, the fermentation from, the, well, let's say the alcohol from the wine would make the water safe to drink. So when they're drinking for their thirst, they're drinking water that has some alcohol in it to kill the yuckies. Does that make sense? So that water is separate from the water for purification. So they've got these, these big, these six uh, stone, what's the word they use? Not pitchers, jars. And notice, I thought this was interesting. Each one held 20 to 30 gallons. That's a, that's a big rock they cut this thing out of, and there's six of them. And a gallon is about eight pounds. Okay. So you got a lot. You got to be you got to be hefty to carry them puppies. <laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> verse seven. Jesus said to the servants, "Fill the jars with water." And they filled them up to the brim. I love when John gives us details. It's important. If they had only filled the jars halfway, then Jesus might have, might have been doing some kind of little underhanded little trick. He might have poured wine in on top of the water. But to make sure that we and the folks there knew that the only thing in that jar was water. John clarifies they filled it to the brim with water. So six jars filled all the way to the brim with water. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, when did that happen? It doesn't tell us when it happened. It's in the white space between verse 8 and 9. In your Bible, that little white sp that little space between the period and the little number 9. We don't know. There's six jars, water to the brim. They dip in to the water, and, and when they give it to the master of ceremonies, he sips it, and it's wine. Somewhere along the way, Jesus has changed the water into wine. Personally, I think that this is purely coincidental. But I do think it's interesting that the first miracle that Jesus performed was changing water into wine, and the first plague that Moses conducted or led change the water into blood. I really think it's coincidence, but I also think it's kind of cool that they both used water for their first miraculous event. Jesus 
changed the water into wine before it reached the master of ceremonies. And in verse 9, when the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, he did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. Uh, two things that jump out at me that I love there. He called the bridegroom over. Remember, the groom pays for everything. This is his party, as it should be. <laughs> he called the bridegroom over, and he said, Dude, you serve some good wine. I love that Jesus didn't jump up and say, Hey, I did that. He wasn't here to draw attention to self. It wasn't about Jesus. We're going to find out that it was about giving the disciples a reason to believe. His hour had not yet come, so he wasn't interested in the crowds. He wasn't interested in the multitudes. Matter of fact, we're going to see a few times through the gospel that he tells people, don't tell anybody who I am yet. It's not time. He, he didn't care about the accolades. The whole purpose of doing this was so that those six guys that were hanging out with him would believe that he was who he said he was. And John says the whole purpose of the gospel was so that we could believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing we could have life. So he lets the bridegroom get the credit, if you will. The other thing that I love about it is the master of the feast said, most people do it this way. They bring out the top shelf stuff first. And then once everybody gets a little bit, little bit goofy on that top shelf stuff, <laughs> they don't even notice that you have switched to the wine that you got out of a box that you got at the Sam's. <laughs> they don't even know that you switch things around. But you, he says, you did it the other way around. Everyone serves, I'm back in 10, everyone serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then the poor wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. Now listen what John tells us. This, the first of his signs. See, there's our word. Not miracle, not magic <clears throat> trick, but sign. In other words, it's pointing people to something. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did in Cana, at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. He did it not for the crowd. Most of the crowd never even knew. The MC didn't even know what was going on. But his six dudes knew. His disciples knew. So now they would and did believe that he was who he said he was. So uh, the last one, the last verse, just to just to kind of give you a cliffhanger to make you come back next week. <laughs> After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother. By the way, this I, I don't know that this has any major significance, but again, it's just interesting to me. John never says Mary. In the Gospel of John, we never see her name. We know her name from the synoptics, the other Gospels. But when John refers to her, John refers to her as the mother of Jesus. I think that's because by the time he wrote this, he was the primary caretaker of Mary, and he wants everybody to remember, she's not my mama, she's his. I'm doing this for him. But anyway, uh, after, he went, after this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples. They stayed there for a few days. He's in Cana. And he went down to Capernaum, which is right here on the north side of the Sea of Galilee. Now, when you and I look at a map, we say, if he's here, 
He went up to Capernaum. Why does it say he went down to Capernaum? There's two reasons. One, when you and I talk about up and down, we, we're talking about direction. North is up, south is down. That's just because somewhere along the way we had to come up with a standard so that all of our maps made sense. You remember when we used to have paper maps? <laughs> In order for us to read those things, we all had to know that north was at the top, right? So, so you and I grew up learning up is north, down is south. For them, when they talked about moving from one place to another, they thought about it topically. The highest places were up, the lowest places were down. Now, if you look at the geography, it makes sense, doesn't it? Capernaum would be lower than Cana. Why? Because it's on the, the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Water flows down. So it makes sense. This is down. There's another reason. That would be true of any, anybody during that time. They would use it in that way. But Jews specifically have another reason that it refers to that. And that is Jerusalem is home. Jerusalem is headquarters. Jerusalem is the temple. So no matter where you are in the world, if you're going to Jerusalem, you're going up to Jerusalem. Now, it is one of the highest places in that area, topographically, but it is spiritually also of such significance that when a Jew is talking, no matter where you are, if you're headed toward Jerusalem, you're going up. If you're headed away from Jerusalem, you're going down. So he's in Cana, going to Capernaum. He's going away from Jerusalem, so he goes down to Capernaum. 